Yeah, all right. Got another one back there. Radical. <laughs> all right. Well, we're just glad you're here. You know, the Bible, is, it, it's very clear that it says where two or three are gathered together, right? Isn't that what you said? Yeah, it's what you say. Yeah, I say. Uh, yeah, and he's in the midst. That's all it takes, two or three. And so uh, that's all right. And we'll just let the Lord do what he wants to do t uh, tonight and to touch us, minister to us, and just uh, uh, teach us some great things tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just come to you tonight. We just want to just thank you for this time, this moment, just to... Uh, just to be in your house, and we love the Word of God. We love to be in your house and to fellowship with you, to worship you, to praise your holy name. We're just so thankful, Lord, that your your presence is here, and that we can just uh, uh, just uh, relax in you, and and the the joy of the Lord can just be our strength, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is here in our in our minds in our in our hearts so lord we just yield to what the holy ghost wants to teach us today and we know there's a message there's a truth that you want to uh, uh, proclaim and project uh, before us so lord we just want to be let our spiritual ears be sensitive and let our uh, hearts be open to what the holy ghost wants to teach us in jesus holy name amen all right i'll try to make this short and sweet amen all right, well, I, <laughs> all right, how about if I make it how about if I make it long and make you all sleepy? How's that? Promise you won't go to sleep on me. All right. You know, uh, let me begin with uh, a research I was doing today about I was doing a poll. I like to get a feeling as to what the church world is thinking about the coming of the Lord. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, the end times, and we're going to talk about Israel and how it uh, we have a, uh, th there's a prophecy, and, and we want to bring that out to you. But there was a poll put out uh, by the uh, Nashville-based Lifeway Research. And they, they titled it Evan Evangelism um, to the End Times. And this is what they said, and this kind of uh, makes you think. In what Christians call the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, we know that, Jesus tells his followers to make disciples of all nations, which is often understood as a command to spread the faith to all dis distinct groups. Previously, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus connects this occurring, of course, in his second coming, and the good news of the kingdom is uh, proclaimed to all the world as a testimony to the nations, and then the end will come. Now, it says, according to this poll, Protestant pastors are split, however, on whether Christians can actually speed up the return of Christ uh, by helping to share the gospel with all pe uh, people groups. So, so there's a, a thinking out there, and this is what uh, some of them are thinking. They said that close to two in five, or 41 percent, believe Christians can hasten Jesus' coming through world evangelism. In other words, Jesus said that this gospel, gospel will be preached unto all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. Uh, I was at teaching one uh, on a uh, at our international the IMA conference here years ago, and I was teaching on the uh, Jewish year and uh, what it means and significance of the of the that particular Jewish year. And so uh, I had a had a minister come up to me. He was, he's based in Florida and he said to me, you know, the, this scripture does say, you know, this gospel will be preached unto all the world, then shall the end come. But what about those people who are born? There's constant birth throughout the world. How can the gospel be preached if we're constantly repopulating the earth? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> but the Bible is very clear that the gospel will be preached unto all the world, and then shall the end come. So the uh, so what they said then is that uh, about half, fifty four percent disagree, and their disagreement is based that God has His timing. There is the evangelistic part is what they agree in, but yet God still has His timing uh, as to how He's going to uh, fulfill the uh, prophetic events that the Bible uh, 
uh, talks about. And so uh, what they said that four and ten pastors believe the pace of sharing the gospel, what Jesus has done, will impact the timing of Christ's uh, return. So as far as de uh, de uh, denominationally, uh, nationally, uh, it said that the it was the Pentecostal uh, uh, pastors or the denominations uh, in that area, 66% are the most likely to agree Christians can speed up Jesus' return by sharing the gospel. So the Pentecostals hold and adhere uh, by the majority to, the, uh, uh, to that aspiration that as we preach the gospel and as it's uh, proclaimed throughout the world that this is going to be the time frame that God's going to follow. I had an had a, a older preacher come here, a Baptist preacher came here many years ago, and he preached a sermon that uh, you could be the last person that God is waiting on before Jesus returns. And, you know, it was really good and thinking, and it does provoke you to think about that is, is there somebody in the church that that's the one that God is waiting for to preach the gospel, and then the end will, uh, time clock will begin to tick. So uh, I thought that was very interesting. In Luke chapter 21 and 25, I told Pastor Rick Wednesday, I'm going to start with this. And I began to think about the end times and where we're heading and where we are at. We haven't heard too much about it lately. Brother Van used to preach this and teach this. If it's in the news, uh, preach on it and teach on it. And what's going to be coming in the news and they've been talking about it already in June. They're going to uh, talk about the UFO phenomena. And it's beginning to hit the headlines again. And people are, uh, they're going to be coming out, they're saying. And it's just going to be an investigation that's going to be released on the UFO phenomena. And what does that mean? Uh, is there any, what's, what's the uh, uh, Christian based uh, feeling uh, on that. I've studied up on it. I bought books on that. And uh, being a student of astronomy that I am, that I, 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 I've done some thorough research on that, and I have my own opinion. But I won't share that tonight. We'll leave that for another time. I'll let you know that's what we're going to be hearing here shortly. And it says, verse 25, And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon, and in the stars. And now, it makes me think whenever we go on trips, you know, you see these signs, and it says, and it explains to you, maybe you're getting closer to, to like, Disney World. They'll, they'll start, like, out 100 miles out, <laughs> and that's the truth. And they'll begin to uh, uh, advertise, you're getting closer, and uh, there's this hotel, there's this place to stay. That's it. And, and so, so there are signs uh, also in the coming of the Lord. It says there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, the uh, distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves are roaring. Let me stop right there and just explain something to you. When the Bible talks about end time events, it, it's not in chronological order. For example, when it says that the seas and the waves are, are going to be roaring, it, it puts it into the third place here. But when we look into last year, remember last year's hurricane season? This is what the statistics showed, that the seas and the waves were roaring dramatically last year. And they said it was a record-breaking hurricane season, and there were a record-breaking um, 30 named storms and 12 land-falling storms in the continental, continental United States. So this is the most storms on record, surpassing the 28 from 2005, and it's the second highest number of hurricanes on record. So if, when we look at the seas and the waves are roaring, and it makes you wonder and ponder, are we looking at the, uh, uh, like what happened last year, are we looking at a, uh, an increase in the, um, in the area of the hurricane? And uh, when, when I think of how that, of course, the moon controls the tides and the waves, if there's, is there going to, come a shifting in the moon's uh, rotation and axis that could trigger a uh, change in the seas and the waves. But, but the, that kind of 
makes you think of uh, what happened last year. In the distress of nations with perplexity, of course, no doubt is the worldwide pandemic. We have never had such a distress of nations as we have had in my lifetime. And, uh, and to just see the impact uh, that is happening on the world. In fact, right before we left tonight, we were just uh, listening to what's going on in India. India going through a devastating uh, attack of the pandemic and the, uh, the economic and the personal lives are just uh, unbelievable uh, in the changes. Not only that hap that's happened there, happening now, but it's happening around the world. So when we look at that, we uh, see then that uh, it seems to be not in chronological, chronological order. If we take this verse to imply of today's uh, headlines, and it says that, of course, the, uh, there will be signs in the sun, and the moon and the stars. And of course, you know, it made me think of this, that the celestial signs, uh, you know, it was associated with Jesus' first coming, the star of Bethlehem. So when we look at that, the celestial signs of the first coming, it doesn't surprise us that we see events that are going to occur that will signal uh, his second coming. We're not sure what that is. The Bible didn't go into detail, but, you know, there are times you just got to let prophecy do its uh, thing and just uh, just watch uh, what happens. And uh, as I continue, it says that men's hearts fail in them from uh, fear and the expectation of those with, uh, things which are coming on the earth. It will sound like to me uh, what it's talking about, uh, heart attacks, uh, stress from what's happening on the earth in their world and their in their uh uh, social life and so forth, that there, there's, a, uh, there's a fear going on, the expectation of things that are coming on the earth. And the Bible said the powers of the heavens are going to be shaken. Now, we can take that to mean spiritually that uh, the powers of the heavens, so we're talking about the, uh, the, uh, the demonic activity and the uh, angelic activity, the warfare going on, uh, uh, we can look at it that way. Uh, but it says this in verse uh, uh, 27, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Boy, he's here today in power and great glory. You know, but he's coming, and every eye's going to see him and uh, know that this is the one that was proclaimed and prophesied. And it says right here in 28, now, when these things begin to happen, we're seeing it. When all these things begin to happen, he said this, look up. This is a time not to look down. This is a time not to look around. But this is a time the Bible says, your Bible says, to look up. Look up, church. Look up. Because your redemption is drawing near. Aren't you glad of that? There's coming a moment he's going to catch us away. There's a moment that's going to come when that trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first and we're going to be called up together with him. So he's telling the church, he's encouraging them that, uh, that to look up, look up and be assured that your redemption is drawing nigh. And, uh, you know, I, I began to think about that and uh, I remember when, uh, as a young, young, uh, young adult, coming to Bible Center Church, you know, Brother Van was a student of Bible prophecy, eschatology, and he used to preach this at Bible Center Church. Does your wife? Does your wife? I knew I was going to say that. Does your life qualify or disqualify you? For the rapture. I almost said wife. I was going to say that as joking. Does your wife qualify you? <laughs> but I said it anyway. <laughs> Does your life qualify or disqualify you for the rapture? I mean, you, you, I mean, you were thinking, boy, that you'd squirm in your seat over that if you feel like you weren't right with God. So he would challenge you to do an introspection of your life. And I challenge you today. Does your life today qualify or disqualify you for the rapture? It's time to do an introspection of your life, personal inventory. So in other words, if Jesus would come today, would you go in the rapture? Would you? Would you go? 
I hope you would. Um, some of the religious Jewish rabbis in Israel today believe, the Orthodox Jews we're talking about, believe that the redemption of the world revolves around the temple sacrifices and its redemptive services in the temple. Of course, you know, the Christian believer believes Jesus is the uh, final and the ultimate uh, redemption of the world, and that's what we believe and adhere to. But one thing is missing in the rabbinic belief uh, in the redemption process, and they are very clear about this and adamant about it, that it is the ashes of the para adama or the red heifer. Some of you may be new to this uh, uh, theological thinking, and I'll try to explain a little bit, a bit about that. Around 1992, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem received information of a farmer raising red heifers on a farm in America. And Rabbi Haim Richman, who's over, director of the Temple Institute, he bought a plane ticket from Israel and he flew to the United States. And he met a man, a farmer, who was raising the red heifers. And uh, the, the man's name was uh, Clyde Lott. He was a uh, Pentecostal minister, a Pentecostal preacher. Uh, Clyde Lott, and so uh, so Richmond goes over there, and he uh, examines the red heifers, uh, the herd that uh, uh, that uh, the farmer was raising, and to see it was if it was kosher according to Numbers 19. And I used to talk about this at work, and I would stir them up about the ashes of the red heifer and about a pure red heifer. Now, let me explain to you what the what Matthew, or I'm sorry, what Numbers 19 says as to why this has a eschatological uh, application uh, and to the end times, and and how the Jewish uh, belief agrees and corresponds to the Christian belief in the end times. I'll tie that in together here in a moment. Let me explain to you Numbers chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, uh, in which there is no defect on on which a yoke has never come. In other words, the red heifer had to be entirely pure. We've seen it when all, all of us, you know, traveling around farms, you know, and so forth, passing. We've seen red heifers. If there were several white hairs on the red heifers, it made it invalid. It was not kosher. They could not sacrifice it uh, according to the uh, um, uh, the Torah's uh, uh, recommendations. To the book of Numbers. And it says, verse uh, uh, 3, And you shall give it to Elisha the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. Now, what they would do in the days of Jesus uh, prior to that, what they would do in that time, they would go up to the Mount of Olives, some of you have been to Israel, Mount of Olives, and there they would sacrifice the pure red heifer. They would burn uh, the heifer and then collect the ashes. And the purpose of it, according to the Bible here, is this, that... Uh, that in verse 18, that a clean person shall take his, if in other words, a purified person, a rabbi, a high priest, that he shall take his and dip it in water and sprinkle it on the tent and all the vessels on the person who were there or on the one who touched the bone, the slain, the dead, or the grave. So what they're saying is this. If you, a Jewish person, touched a dead body, you, were, you became ritually impure. And the only way... For you to be cleansed is with the ashes of the pure red heifer. Now, in Israel, since 1948, they have not had, they've had five wars, and they have not had a red heifer. So, ritually, the nation of Israel, the masses in there, are ritually impure, and they need the uh, uh, ashes of the red heifer. Now, uh, they and the rabbis know this, and so what they decided to do after Rabbi uh, Richmond he returned to the United States, he uh, the, they met and they decided that you know it's been two thousand years since the last red heifer was slain. Are you with me? Two thousand years, around sixty seven A.D. is what we understand when the last red heifer was slain. The ashes collected. 
put in a vessel called a kalah, and it was uh, hidden according to the copper scroll that was discovered in 1952. They've been searching for the ashes of the red heifer in the vessel. They haven't found it. So the thinking is then let's just try to see if we can breed the red heifers here in Israel. So Rabbi Richmond, he bought, they understand, Temple Institute bought some red heifers, brought it to the United States, and secretly in a farm, at a farm in Israel today, they are breeding the red heifers. And, it's, and over the years, they would uh, uh, talk about it and thought that they would uh, have one, but then it would become ritually uh, impure. Now, the, they, know, they know this, and Rabbi Richmond and rabbis over there know this, that they cannot have a temple without the ashes of the red heifer to purify the priesthood, the kohanim, the priesthood, and the masses over there. Okay, and so then uh, they know that. In fact, this, their idea of a temple fits right in with Christian eschatology because the Bible is very clear that in the last days that a temple is going to exist and it's going to be rebuilt in the end times prior to Jesus' return. It's mentioned in four places in the Bible. It's mentioned in Matthew 24, verse 15. It's mentioned in Mark chapter 13, verse 14. It's mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1. It talks about the temple, the abomination of desolation. So, so something has to happen for them to rebuild the temple, and what has to happen prior to that is the, um, is the ashes of the red heifer. Red heifer. Now, I, uh, back in March, uh, the Temple Institute put out about a, about a three-minute video. I brought in, and I want you to, are we able to play that? If we're able to play that, uh, I want you to hear this is 2021, just a month ago. This is where we stand in the prophetic of the end time third temple and we're going to try to play that here and I think you'll find that uh, uh, interesting because the Antichrist has to oh has to go in there and stop the sacrifice let's see if we can get that up Shalom this is Yitzhak Ruvain from the Temple Institute today is the first day of March 2021 it's the 17th of Adar 5781 and as you can see, I'm standing in front of two, they're kind of hidden at the moment, two parot adumot, two red heifers that the Temple Institute is raising here in Israel. And I'm giving you an update on their status. The last update was about uh, seven or eight months ago. And at the time, we had two red heifers who were getting very close to the age where they could be converted into the ashes of the red heifer but they had some white hairs, which we hoped would go away. They didn't, so they are not kosher. Here are other parot, other heifers that are also approaching the right age, and they are 99.9% .9 red, but each one does have a few hairs that aren't red, which makes them pasul, which makes them not kosher in terms of being a red heifer. So again, as we explained last time we spoke, there is a chance that those white hairs could turn into red hairs, and so we just have to wait and see. So we're no closer than we were half a year ago when we last uh, checked up on the cows, but it takes patience, and uh, we have lots of patience. We've been waiting 2,000 years. We'll wait a little bit longer till we get a perfectly red heifer so that we can proceed with preparing the ashes and arriving at a situation where we can actually achieve purity, uh, tahara, purity of the highest level, the level that's needed in order to do the service in the Holy Temple and for the pilgrims to actually arrive and bring their offerings. We're coming very close to Passover, and of course on Passover, everyone in Israel is intended to bring a lamb for the Passover offering and to actually come with the lamb into the temple courtyards, and for that, we need the red heifer in order to achieve the temple purity that is necessary. So, once again, Yitzhak Rubin from the Temple Institute, here with our red heifers. We'll keep you updated. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Wow. What do you think about that? Yeah, they're talking about Bible prophecy because they got to have the, uh, the uh, red heifer, the ashes, to purify. 
the priesthood and uh, the masses over there, and then of course the rebuilding of the temple would be uh, uh, would be, uh, I think, uh, pretty quick. Now there's a very interesting prophecy that has come out uh, about this uh, red heifers, and uh, let me explain to you something. Uh, in the ancient Jewish writings called the Mishnah, they, t they said that uh, there's been a total of nine red heifers over history. Okay, starting with Moses, uh, which started and began the first uh, offering of the red heifer. The second one was Ezra uh, in the days of the first temple. And during the entire uh, era of the second temple, which Jesus grew up in and disciples went to uh, up and in, into that uh, particular time frame, there were seven more that were used for the ashes. All right. So uh, there was enough to provide for the nation's need. What happened is this. As the ashes would deplete, one would be supernaturally born perfect, perfect, kosher, for the sacrifice, and so then they would uh, offer it. Now, the names of the high priests are, are well known in Jewish history, the seven. And what's very interesting, that there is one that we would know. If you know your Bible, you would know this one. That the, uh, the next one that offered the uh, ashes, his name was uh, Shimon. Or as we would say in our English, the name Simon. Simon, the high priest. Now, if you know your Bible, if you know a little bit uh, uh, about Jesus' birth, you know in Luke chapter 2, 25, there was a Simon, the just. He's called in Jewish history, Simon, the righteous. Both adjectives are synonymous. synonymous. So, just in, and so it's believed then that this is the guy, this is the one who offered then the third and the fourth perfect red heifer in his time. And here comes Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. Remember, the Lord told him he would not die till he saw the Messiah. And so they bring him in, the Holy Ghost speaks to him and tells him this is the Messiah and he's the one that he's the, he's the ashes of the red heifer he's the perfect lamb he's all that the sacrifices were it's all in him and so then he takes baby Jesus in his arms and he holds him you know I, I, I gave this uh, sermon in when I was in Romania and I taught on that and how that Jesus wants you to take him in your arms. Are you willing to do that? Are you ready to release the weight, the burdens that are holding you down, that are weighing your arms down? Take Jesus in your arms today. Take him. Draw him close to your heart. Hold on to him. Don't let him go. And that was the desire of uh, Simeon, the just, to hold and to see and to embrace the Messiah. Take him in your arms, and that's what he desires from you today. Amen. So he's, he's, he would be one of them, and the others uh, are mentioned in the, uh, in the Mishnah account. And so what they, there's a, and then later on, there was passed down by oral tradition. There is the written tradition of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. And then there is, there's what they call the oral tradition, where Moses and the prophets then would pass down to the men of the great assembly, the 120 men who uh, were, uh, were with the prophets, and the prophets taught them and gave them some spiritual insight into the Torah, into the law. And these 120 men will protect the law. And it was passed down from generation to generation, oral tradition. And, and a rabbi by the name of Maimonides, he's one of the greatest rabbis in history. He, he said this, that when the 10th hef, heifer 
is born, and when it's sacrificed, it's going to be sign, a sign of the coming of the Messiah. We're already, you hear what I said? Nine's been offered. Now, the tenth one, we're looking at, that could very well be the tenth one that has been passed down by the prophets to the men of the great assembly, to Maimonides, who took the oral tradition and passed it down to the Jewish people, and, and we received that, that this tenth red heifer, and when it happens, count your days, count your hours, count your months. It's a time that the Messiah, King Messiah, is coming and making his appearance. We know who that is. We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so uh, the Jewish eschatology and Christian eschatology kind of ties in together because we're expecting these events uh, to happen. And I just, can I hold you for a few more minutes? Okay, and um, I began to uh, look into Mark chapter 13, and I began to look into this area of prophecy in Mark 13, verse uh, 33, and he, he's encouraging us this, uh, take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know... When the hour when the Lord has come. In 1988, I was at work at uh, uh, Me Johnson. And uh, they were circulating at that time. And I was uh, helping in a crusade here in Evansville. And they were talking about this. That there was a book that came out in 1988 that said 19, or 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in, in 1988. I remember that, and the, and that's when the rapture is going to happen. This the man who produced this book put on there an extraordinary um, mathematical explanation as to why he believed that Jesus was coming back in 1988, and uh, on on the Feast of Trumpets is around September 17, 18, somewhere in there, that he believed that it would happen in 1988. Guess what happened? Uh, what? Well, well, yeah, unless we missed it. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So, he missed it. So, what happened? In, in 1989, he wrote another book. 89 reasons, <laughs> yeah, why Jesus is coming back in 1989. And the reason why he missed it in 88, because he made a mathematical error. Well, he missed it again, and we never heard a 1990 after that. <laughs> it never did. So, so he believed then in that uh, he thought he nailed down, but no one knows a day or the hour, but you can know the season. We're in that season. And he says, take heed, watch and pray. The word take heed means in the Greek to look intently and to give un undivided attention and to watch and pray for you do not know when the hour but it is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and each he commanded the doorkeeper to watch. I just want to take a moment and just talk to you about a doorkeeper. Are you a doorkeeper? We are. Are you a doorkeeper to the heart? And in, I believe that it's possible what Jesus was talking about, the doorkeeper, because in the temple we are told by the rabbis and even in Jesus' day, they knew it, they saw this, that there were uh, doorkeepers in the temple. In fact, the Jewish writings say that the priests watched over, they were doorkeepers, very strict about this, over three areas in the temple. And it really speaks to us today in our lives. One was the chamber, was the chamber of Abtinus, or the chamber of incense. Remember, incense was, was lit twice a day, and it was one of the most coveted positions for a person to officiate in. And the reason why is this. The, the, uh, the golden altar stood right in front of the holies of holies. You couldn't get any closer to the Shekinah glory of God than at the altar of incense. And the altar of incense represents prayer, see, um, and I, uh, we see that in uh, in the Gospel of Luke, where it says where they were praying, and the whole 
multitude of temple were praying outside at the hour of incense under Zechariah's ministry. We know in Psalms 141, verse 2, it says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, lifting up as, my, uh, as a evening sacrifice. So what he's saying is this, that they were, they were a doorkeeper. Somebody was delegated all night to stand guard, to stand uh, in position, and to watch over the door to the incense chamber. And what does that incense chamber mean to us today? It could be praise or worship, because that's what incense represents, prayer. To have the, that we guard our prayer life in a sense that, that we remember to be thankful, to be, uh, uh, and to uh, trust in his word, to remember the intercessions uh, that we have, the petitions. And are you guarding your prayer life? You know, there were 11 secret ingredients in the incense. And only, only uh, the uh, priests of that particular uh, course knew how to mix it and perform the, uh, the exact uh, specifications of the, of the ingredients. So are you guarding and being the doorkeeper to your prayer life? And uh, it made me think then that the, uh, the, uh, the other doorkeeper was this, was in the chamber of the spark. When Jesus says, be, you be the doorkeeper, get the doorkeepers in charge. The chamber of the spark, what it is, there was a place in the temple, and these, the, the uh, Jesus disciples, they knew this. When they would go in there, there was a chamber, and there they would have fire that was constantly or perpetual lit. It never went out. And what it was was this, that uh, according to, to the uh, word of God in Leviticus 6.13, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. So if some reason the fire on the altar started to go out, they would have a reserve fire all the time, 24-7, constantly burning burning so that they could take that fire and take it to the altar and relit it or kept it lit at the time that uh, it seemed to be diminishing. So my question is you, to you today, are you guarding the fire that's in inside your life? Are you guarding the fire of the Holy Ghost? Has your fire gone out? Has your fire been going out lately? Have you lost the zeal? Has you lost the fervency? I want to encourage you tonight to come back to God, get on fire for God in, in the rest of this year, in the rest of your life. Uh, stay hot for the Lord. Don't let the the coldness uh, of events or whatever impact and change your walk, but be on fire. Guard, be the doorkeeper, and guard the fire of the Holy Ghost in your life. You know, the, the uh, rabbis tell us this, that, that there were ten wonders that were done in the temple. Ten wonders. And they said this. One of them was this, that the rain never quenched the fire of the altar. That was a wonder. It would be storming around them. It would be some heavy rains, which we just recently uh, had. But the sun, supernaturally, that fire, it stayed lit. God made sure. Watch over according to his, his word. God wants over his word to perform. If, you gave, if he gave you a promise out of his word, I mean, no rain's going to put it out. No storm's going to stop it. No issue is going to impact the promise he made in your life. You hold on to the promises of God. Don't let the fire go out in your life. And the third uh, watch by the priesthood was this that it was called the chamber of the hearth. And in it, in this chamber, were four other smaller chambers where the lambs were kept, where the showbread was made, where the old altar stones were, uh, were stored there. And it was a chamber for a uh, uh, for water immersion. And in the middle of, these, of this chamber that the doorkeeper was watching over, there was right in the middle was a marble uh, uh, floor, and attached to this was a slab of marble that when they would open it up, there would be a chain, and there would be a key on that chain. 
And what the priest would do every morning, they would, one priest would be designated, he would, uh, uh, he would, he would sleep all night over that chain, over that key. Because if anybody tried to get the key, they had to go through him. And he would sleep right over that marble slab where the key was kept. And then in the morning, he would wake up, he would, he would open that up, get the key, and he would then unlock the door to the temple and allow the people access into the temple. And the same at night, they would close the door because they didn't want any, no robbers, no thieves or anything to come in and to try to take uh, the temple uh, treasures. And so uh, I asked you this, are you a doorkeeper? Are you holding on to the key? You know, the Bible says that uh, Jesus is the key of David. And uh, so I, I, I asked you this, and are you standing strong at the door? How's your key of faith? How's your key of joy? How's your key of peace? And how's your, uh, your key of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, blessing, whatever that key is in your life, are you holding on to that key? Protect that key. Watch over that promise that he's given you. And don't let the enemy come in and try to take what is yours. So as I finish this, he says it is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants to each his work, commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. At the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. Don't be sleeping. We're too close to the coming of the Lord as the events begin to happen, as, as we see more events begin to uh, occur and come to pass. And Jesus said this, And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Watch yourself. Watch your walk. Watch for his coming. For he's coming at a time in our life that we think not. Who knows if maybe 2021 could be the year where things really begin to escalate and things begin to happen prophetically, you know, 2021. Let's stand. I hope I've been able to encourage you tonight to see where we're at, where we are at prophetically, and to see the expectation of the Jewish people as they prepare uh, for the uh, ashes of the red heifer and the rebuilding of the temple. But Jesus is encouraging us, be a strong doorkeeper. Watch, pray, pray without ceasing. Don't give up, don't quit. If I'm speaking to someone in here tonight, I want to encourage you today is this, you just hang in there. Hang in there. Jesus said, we will have tribulation. We will have pressures. It's just part of life. We'll have that. But he said this, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If he overcame the world, then Jesus and you can overcome the world. You can make it. You're overcomers, church. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So, Lord, we just want to thank you tonight, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for encouraging us. We thank you for the word of God, Lord, that we heard tonight. It's not my words. It is your words. You have given these words to comfort us, to encourage us, to let us know, God, that, that you care for your people. And uh, you, you said in your word, uh, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Shall I hide from my church? No. He wants to reveal these things to us because he wants his church to be ready. And, and I just thank you for that. Um, I want you to look up here for a moment. I just want to explain to you something that he gave me years ago. He gave me a message to tell the church. I was in heaven. It was a dream. 
I see these beautiful tables that look to be four by four feet. About every eight feet I saw. What I saw was real. It was real to me. They were in perfect rows in what seemed like eternity in, all direct, in, in, in both directions here. I mean, as far as the eye could see. And as I began to look at that, I, my eyes lifted up and I saw bookshelves and library shelves on both sides of the tables that I saw that ran for eternity. And these tables, these sh bookshelves stood about eight to ten feet tall and ran, ran also on both sides uh, with the tables that I saw. As far as eternity, I could, it just ran. I couldn't see the end of it. On both sides, I couldn't see the end. And in this bookshelves, I saw books together, crammed together. And it seemed to me that there were billions of books that I saw in the library of heaven. And it dawned on me that's what I was standing in the midst of, the massive library that contained the history of every person throughout the ages. I'm there. I'm seeing this. It is real. A person behind me, and I'm captivated, a person behind me pulls out a book, goes over my shoulder, pulls out a book, and it is the book of my life. He opens it up, and immediately I notice that there's just a few pages left. He's at the end of the book. It's all filled except for several pages. And, and I began to think, why are those pages empty? And it's dawned on me, God is saying, I'm not through with you yet. You'll be going to Romania. You'll be going to Russia. Uh, I'll be using you here at the church in the end times. And that uh, it dawned on me that there are some things still unfinished in my life that he wants to do. There's a destiny still for me to finish before the rapture of the church. So I saw then, if that's me, if that's all there is in the pages of my life, I thought, my Lord, how much time do I have? What are we looking at? Not a whole lot, I, I begin to think. And then, I, and then I, as I see the person turn the pages and just he just holds it there, I wonder who it is. And I turn around, and it is Jesus. He's holding the pages, the book of my life and the destiny. And I look at him, I look at his face, and he tells me this, tell my people I'm coming soon. I want to tell you, church, he told me to tell you, I'm coming soon. He's coming for a bride who has made herself ready. Are you ready? Are you qualified or disqualified for the rapture? So I began to think about what he's telling me. And I, and I sense in his voice a concern. I sense in his voice that he was concerning about, is the church going to slumber? Is it going to sleep? Is there going to come a uh, sleepiness, a time in, in their walk in the, in the Christian church where they're going to miss, miss out on the coming of the Lord? I've seen a grave concern in his voice. And he wanted me to tell you, and I tell it in Sunday school all the time, right, Rodon, and you guys know who are here. I tell you all the time, and I got to tell you again, he's coming again. He told me to tell you, I'm coming again. So are you ready? Are you ready? Be ready. Say the sinner's prayer, church, or whoever you are, be sure to say the sinner's prayer. Get right with God because he's coming at a time and at an hour, and that we think not. If you have any questions about the second coming of the Lord, Randy's here. He'll be answer, answer, uh, glad to answer all your questions. <laughs> I'll be here for a little while. So, hey, thank you so much for listening. I hope this has been encouraging. And just, uh, you know, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. 
and to let you know he's coming soon. Be ready. Amen. Thank you for coming tonight. I already did it. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I can't.